Good evening, everyone. My name is Benedict Lecca, Executive Director of the Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island. It is my pleasure this evening to welcome Randall Charlton, author of The Wicked Pilgrim, a look behind the scenes of the building of Mayflower II, which is the replica of the original Mayflower. My thanks to a friend of the Redwood, Charles Wharton, who introduced us to Randall and helped to bring him to us. I want to uh, take a split second to remind everyone that uh, A, up top to the right is the help button. If you have any issues with sound and uh, other things, uh, make sure that you hit the compatibility button and all your problems should be solved. I would also point out the donate button at the bottom. Boy, would we be grateful if you chose to donate, of course. Uh, I would also invite all viewers to join as Redwood members. And when you go back to our YouTube channel to view this program again and again, don't hesitate to sign up as a uh, subscriber to the Redwood YouTube channel. That'd be of great help to us. And I thank you in advance for both of those. Now, without Randall Charlton's father's perseverance and tenacity, the Mayflower II may never have been constructed. It is a fascinating tale, and Randall is here with us now, live from London, to share the details. Randall, take it over. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Benedict. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to speak to members and friends of the Redwood Library and Athenaeum tonight. And uh, I had the pleasure of uh, just over a year ago being shown around Newport uh, by my friend Charles Wharton. And um, uh, I was particularly impressed with this um, beautiful library that you have. Uh, this, uh, for those that have not been to the library as the outside shot, inside um, it's even better, it's amazing. And they've got a wonderful team of people there to greet you. Um, perhaps I can begin um, because I've worked and lived in America for the last uh, 20 years until, um, until recently uh, when I got stuck here with COVID. Um, by wishing everyone uh, on this call uh, and webinar uh, a really happy Thanksgiving. Uh, as you know, it's the 400 year anniversary of the journey of the first Mayflower to North America in 1620. And on both sides of the Atlantic, there were ambitious and exciting plans to celebrate that first journey of those 102 brave souls. In England, from where I'm speaking, uh, millions of pounds and up to 10 years of preparation work has been spent on building new museums and, and mounting interesting exhibitions to tell the Mayflower story in new and exciting ways, including uh, a multi-million dollar museum at uh, Plymouth University in England. Uh, in multiple locations throughout Britain, um, children in schools, as well as actors uh, in theaters, academics at universities, and worshipers in churches have made ready to tell their part to American visitors in the Mayflower story. Unfortunately, for reasons I think you all know, these stories will have to wait uh, for uh, another year at least for an American audience. This is uh, the Box Museum in Plymouth, uh, England, um, which is gonna be a wonderful attraction for American visitors interested in the Mayflower story. We also have pubs like the next picture, uh, the Mayflower uh, pub in London where Christopher Jones, uh, the captain of the first Mayflower, is supposed to have owned a share of and drunk before and after trips. And 
in addition to that, those who are interested in uh, chasing and finding their connections to those first dissidents, uh, religious dissidents, in North Nottingham, uh, Lincolnshire, and South Yorkshire, we'll see in the next slide um, uh, a, a number of towns where the Brewsters, the Bradfords, and other leaders of that those first religious dissidents came from. And there's a wonderful museum, for example, in a small town of Redford, just 90 minutes north of London, um, which tells the Mayflower story absolutely wonderfully. And then at Gainsborough, um, uh, there's, there's another brilliant museum. And there are churches uh, that celebrate the Mayflower story throughout that area. But they have to wait. Um, but the story of Mayflower 2 doesn't have to wait. And if we look at the next slide, um, we see a ship which, as you, I think you all know, is in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And although some of the celebrations have been shortened because of um, health restrictions, tonight I'd like to delve into the background to the story. As many of you know, um, if we look at the next slide, she was tugged into Mystic Seaport several years ago for repairs uh, where a large team of craftsmen undertook major restoration work at a cost of over $11 million. And I think it's important to note that many of those skilled craftsmen were trained at Newport's International Yacht uh, Restoration School, um, Trade and Technology School, uh, uh, where they do brilliant work in repairing uh, yachts um, of all shapes and sizes, including enormous whalers. And I had a wonderful tour around there um, last year. Uh, over three years, they've lovingly restored Mayflower. And if you see in the next slide, uh, you see a bright new ship that was greeted um, with an enormous crowd um, last September. And I've had the pleasure of being there to see its relaunch. And if you look on the next slide, you'll see how people met uh, before um, COVID uh, restrictions and social distancing. 3,000 people were crammed into Mystic Seaport uh, to take a look at this ship as she was lowered slowly into the water. In many ways, it was undramatic, but it doesn't need to be with Mayflower. For some reason, it strikes a chord a nerve in almost everyone who sees her. My father once said, uh, when he saw the final product, this is a ship I don't need to speak for anymore. She speaks for herself. And the builder um, who, who was responsible for all the construction work in England just kept saying, well, uh, every time he saw her, she's a real beauty. She's a real beauty. And that seemed to um, uh, convey the impression that pretty much everyone gets. Now, at the relaunch, Nathaniel Philbrick, the distinguished author and historian who's written a book about the first Mayflower, um, in his um, keynote speech at Mystic, he said uh, that Mayflower II was a famous ship in her own right. And recently, as many of you may know, she's been formally acknowledged and recognized as an American treasure. At the same time, it's worth remembering that back in 1999, a Dr. Tred, a Ted Broman, writing in the New England Quarterly, described the Mayflower II as this somewhat embarrassing ship. So what is it? that makes this beautiful little ship, uh, the, uh, a vessel that touches a nerve in all who see her and, and arrived in North America in 1957. And in the 60 years plus has since uh, been visited by over 28 million Americans who have walked her wooden decks and 
um, explored the cramped space between decks. The story of where she came from and why she was given to the American people is actually a story that hasn't really been told to the American public until recently. Is she, as some have wondered, uh, the original Mayflower? If not, is she a faithful replica? Was she a gift of the British government or maybe the British people? The true story is a little different. And as I hope to show you, it's no less inspiring at a time when I think we could all use a little inspiration. Let me introduce the man on the screen, uh, my father, Warwick Charlton, dressed in the costume of Miles Standish, who many of you will know was the sole military man that accompanied uh, the first settlers on that first Mayflower. Now, if you think the title of the book, uh, which is the biography of my father, hints at a little mischief, well, I think you'd be right. But it's also a story of passion, a passion for history and a, a strong interest in Anglo-American relationships and our common culture and values. So in addition to Warwick, there are many other players in the story, including, as the next slide, you will see uh, Vice President Nixon there in the middle after Mayflower II arrived. Also others like President Eisenhower and then Senator Kennedy um, have played a role. And on the English side, Britain's wartime prime minister, Sir Winston Churchill and his son, Randolph Churchill, played important parts. As did, and this may surprise you, a gentleman called Ian Fleming, the inventor of James Bond, uh, the English spy of books and movie fame. So let me start with a simple fact. Let's look at the next slide. It's difficult for you to read close up, but on September 11th, 1957, my father, the owner of Mayflower II, put his sole signature to a document transferring Mayflower II to American care for the nominal sum of, wait for it, $1. A few days later, he had the transfer deed co-signed by his partner, John Lowe, and you can see that signature uh, underneath my father's and witnessed by a notary, notary public, you, got, you can see right at the bottom, uh, in front of an official at the American Embassy in London. Why? Because nobody actually believed my father owned the ship. Uh, they needed convincing. So at the moment when the ship changed hands, it's worth pointing out that Mayflower II was the only asset of any value that my father possessed, except perhaps a halfway decent suit and a reasonably priced watch. Uh, he had no house, had no car, he had no savings. He poured everything he owned into this saga. If I had to sum up my father in a sentence or two, I would say he was a shy man, but a man of great passions one of which was a love of history, a man possessed of immense, sometimes manic energy, and certainly not someone who would be ignored when he walked into a crowded room. He was built as tough as teak, over six foot tall, with a powerful voice that he used to good effect when arguing for the causes he believed in. Warwick Charlton was 35, at the time when he decided to abandon his career as an author and writer to pursue his Mayflower dream. He was a writer who, as you can see here, was also a broadcaster who enjoyed success as a playwright, author, a reporter, and a very successful wartime newspaper editor. These talents were recognized by no less than Time magazine who praised his amazing ability 
to produce newspapers under the most extreme wartime conditions. Time magazine also noticed his tendency to challenge authority. If he sounds a rather exotic character, well, he came from exotic parents. His six foot five tall father, my grandfather, Randall Charlton, was a newspaper drama critic and a friend of royalty as well as politicians and newspaper editors who dressed for work every day in a full morning coat, including waistcoat and top hat, and was known by everyone who, uh, in Fleet Street as the last of the dandies. His mother, the daughter of Eastern European immigrants, was a talented academic who chose a, a career on the stage and became a star performer in the pre-war period. They educated my father at a school where students were encouraged to pursue a career in medicine. He developed instead a passion for history. He had no lessons in business. He had no knowledge of shipbuilding and sailing, and he'd never been to the United States. So why on earth did he abandon his career in 1954 and spend every penny he could lay his hands on to follow his Mayflower Odyssey? There's two reasons, I believe. One is related to Great Britain, the other to America. He always told me that the United Kingdoms of the 1950s has em had emerged from the Second World War with its cities and infrastructure in ruins. At the same time, it had lost an empire that encompassed one third of the world, including Canada, India, Australia, and New Zealand. A third of the world was pink. All that was left for post-war Britain, though, was just the boring brick by brick business of rebuilding bombed out British cities. Where, Warwick asked, was the sense of adventure? Where was the food for our spirit? Of equal importance, ever since the end of the Second World War, Warwick had been nurturing the idea of a gesture to America that would thank the United States for their leadership role in preserving freedom and democracy in two world wars and throughout the first half of the 20th century. How do you give a country that appears to have everything something of value? As it happened, Warwick had had a front row view of American generosity in World War II. The British Eighth Army, in which he served on General Montgomery's staff, was being pushed back across North Africa by troops commanded by Germany's Field Marshal Rommel. Britain was fighting a losing battle, in large part because they had inferior equipment, in particular because poor, poorly constructed British tanks kept breaking down in the extreme desert conditions. Warwick was convinced that the war had, would have gone in a very different direction if America had not supported the Allies at this critical time of the conflict. As someone on Montgomery's personal staff, he was designated to help greet emissaries sent by President Roosevelt, including former New York Governor Wendell Wilkie. In short order, much better American tanks and equipment arrived, and with them, the tide of battle turned. British troops that had been retreating desperately now turned and advanced relentlessly across North Africa in their new American tanks, then onto Italy and onto victory. Warwick also noted in uh, post-war conversations with me, the courage of American volunteers, beginning with three squadrons of elite airmen who joined the British Air Force before America entered the war. On a broader scale, there were the American leader, uh, liberty ships that protected British shipping, bringing vital food and other supplies, and the post-war and the wartime Lend-Lease program. Post-war, the US Marshall Plan helped European allies rebuild. My father, an avid reader, happened to pick up a copy of Bradford's journal 
on his way home fr from the war on an American troop ship in 1947. And he was struck by the courage of the early settlers. He found the book a hard read, but worth getting through. And for several years post-war, he toyed with the idea of thanking the American people for their modern day courage and leadership in protecting democracy by giving them something beyond money, a piece of their history, a replica, a real re replica of the original Mayflower. Now, in the beginning, he didn't think for a second he would do it himself. He would persuade his wealthy employers, media barons like uh, Lord Beaverbrook um, or Sir Edward Hulton to put up the money. He approached them and multiple others, including the English Speaking Union and other well-endowed organizations. And one by one, they found a way to say yes over a liquid lunch, but another way to turn him down the following day. And at one point, although he never gave up, he was standing at the bar of, a red of the Red Lion pub just off London's fa famous Fleet Street for journalism, bemoaning his inability to interest people in his Mayflower idea. When a colleague turned to him and said impatiently, let's face it, Warwick, Mayflower 2 is never going to happen. Warwick apparently slammed his beer mug down on the bar counter and announced in a booming voice to anyone within earshot that he would not drink another drop until Mayflower was built and sailed across the ocean to America. That convinced at least the hard-nosed journalists and printers in the pub that Mayflower 2 really was going to happen. And, in, and happen it did. In just over two years, my father found plans for the ship where none existed, a builder for the lost art of wooden sailing ship construction, a captain and a crew to sail it across the Atlantic, American partners also to look after it after arrival. And above all, he found the money to carry out the project, which in today's money would be millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. So now to the question of how did he do it? particularly since he was a man of very limited means, living paycheck to paycheck in an era of severe post-war austerity. Well, for a start, he had a wonderful network of both talented and powerful people that he had in part inherited from his well-connected parents, as well as the men he had bonded with during the war and the immediate post-war period. Some examples, Hugh Cudlip, later Lord Cudlip, head of the, the influential Mirror Media Group. Sir Francis de Gangoyne, General Montgomery's chief of staff and a personal friend of President Eisenhower. And Randolph Churchill, the son of Britain's famous wartime leader, Winston Churchill. Here's a picture of Randolph. It was Randolph Churchill who lectured Warwick in his straightforward way at one point when Warwick was desperate for help. You know nothing about the sea and sailing, he told my father. You therefore, Warwick, have no credibility. However, you can get it. And Randolph Churchill introduced my father to Ian Fleming. Warwick was perplexed. He thought that Ian Fleming wrote books um, starring a guy called James Bond. But it turned out that Fleming had been in naval intelligence during the Second World War and was very close to many of the admirals in the post-war Navy. One by one, Warwick persuaded them to sign on as patrons to the Mayflower 2 project and their names in, adorned his letter, letterhead paper as he sought money from other sources. In fact, they had so many on his letterhead paper and we have copies of those today, that there was barely room for any writing. So next, Warwick used his very good research skills to tap into knowledge 
of one of the world's experts on British history with sailing ships, a Dr. R.C. Anderson, who was the head of maritime research at Greenwich Museum in South London. You see a lovely picture of it here, with, and it's in, on South London for those who have not been there. Um, and you see the city of London in, in the background. So it was a short taxi ride from his um, cramped little office um, in, in the center of London. Um, but it's a beautiful museum and I would recommend it um, for a half day or day visit to anybody um, who um, visits London um, for the first or, or second time. Uh, Warwick um, uh, got from Dr. Anderson um, a, a series of introductions, including uh, an introduction to Henry Hornblower II in Plymouth, Massachusetts. In fact, Henry Hornblower had been researching the possibility of rebuilding the Mayflower in America, but he'd given up. Even this wealthy son of the eighth largest brokerage house in America, and here you see a picture of him shaking hands with Warwick on arrival, had balked at the estimated cost uh, estimates that he'd got. But he offered to support Ply Warwick with the design and construction plans he'd obtained to date, and also to supply a home for the ship uh, when it sailed to America at Plymouth, Massachusetts. Warwick was also introduced by Henry Hornblower to a man called William Baker, an executive at Bethlehem Steel, uh, whose daytime job was designing modern ships and whose lifetime hobby was researching the design of ships of the 1600s, and in particular, Mayflower. And he proved to be an invaluable support to Warwick's passion for building the ship as close as he could get to the actual May original Mayflower. With these commitments, Warwick then turned his attention to fundraising and it was in an age when no one seemed to have any spare money. He produced a range of high quality products, all, all carrying the Mayflower image. Mayflower neckties, Mayflower dinner plates, uh, Mayflower medallions. Uh, if you look at the next slide, there we go. There are the medallions. And then uh, Mayflower stamps uh, for stamp collectors. And in addition, he brought out a newspaper called Mayflower Mail, which was published regularly. But he still had a few things to put in place. One of them walked into his office one day when Warwick was at a particularly low moment. Uh, and that man uh, said he could guarantee a story in National Geographic if Warwick would let him sail as one of the crew. The man was Alan Villiers, an Australian who Warwick described as having the aura of the salty sea about him. My father promptly offers Villiers the job of captain and handed him a massive pile of letters from English people of all ages seeking to sail uh, on the yet to be built Mayflower. After Villiers and here we see him. I think Warwick was right. He does look as though he knows how to sail a ship and was recognized later um, uh, as Warwick found out when he picked up Villiers' resume and discovered to his delight that the man he had selected solely because he could guarantee an article in National Geographic brought with him the added bonus of being one of the most talented and experienced captains of tall sailing ships alive. Throughout the two and a half years of the project, Warwick worked his newspaper contacts mercilessly with a constant stream of stories. And one of them appeared in a weekly magazine read by a guy called Stuart Upham at his shipyard in Brixham, Devon, who happened to be perhaps the last and best builder of large wooden sailing ships in the UK. So he also was a lover of history. 
So before long, my father had several pieces of the Mayflower puzzle in place. The backing of Britain's best sailors, including the commander of the Queen Elizabeth cruise liner. He had a design for the ship from Mr. Baker and um, uh, Greenwich Museum, a shipbuilder dedicated to his historical accuracy, a captain and a crew, a partner in America, and money coming in from his various fundraising schemes. However, as I think you can probably imagine, sales from neckties and other items was not enough, nowhere near. The estimate of 80,000 pounds, which was approximately $240,000 in the money of the time, was a huge amount of money then. And it now looked like rising to double the estimate. At this point, my father demonstrated another talent for lateral thinking. Here are three examples. He received a call one day from Stuart Upham at the shipyard in Devon. Stuart was worried. Construction is being seriously delayed, he told Warwick. Dozens, sometimes hundreds of people are turning up, um, all unannounced, to see what's going on. The men can't get on with their work. In no time at all, Warwick had the ladies who worked as secretaries in his tiny office fitted out in pilgrim costumes and transported 200 miles down to the shipyard. There they gave guided tours for a modest fee and all the money went directly to help the rapidly increasing cost of the ship's construction. Warwick also collected wood chipping off cuts from the construction, which was sold to an insurance company who wanted to give them to the clients, to their clients as Mayflower souvenirs. So let's look at the next slide. And here you will see the keel being laid by a commander Winslow, Winslow who happened to be um, uh, living in retirement um, in Surrey and uh, was a relative who could trace his ancestry back to the original um, Mayflower. And you will see further examples um, uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, here with the young ladies who went from London down to Brixham uh, to run uh, the new exhibition, uh, which my father managed to persuade uh, the British government from um, uh, giving them freedom from entertainment tax. And the next slide. Uh, and there you see um, Warwick's, um, what I call genius for good public relations. He had books which were later to go on the Mayflower and everyone who went round uh, the shipyard was invited to sign this book of good wishes. If there were any American visitors, they were given their money back and Warwick used to say that that was probably the first and only time Americans received their money back um, uh, when they were touring uh, Europe. Uh, he was only half in jest, I think. Uh, but at the same time, he used to find out where uh, the visitors came from and send a press release to the local papers. So whether it was Idaho or Washington or Seattle, Texas, didn't matter where, out would go an email, uh, not an email, forgive me, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm talking 21st century here, uh, uh, a, a press release um, to their local papers. So it was still not enough. Um, and it was then that Warwick hit on the idea of enlisting the support from industry. And if we look at uh, the next slides, just go on a little bit. Uh, I think we're backwards here now. We're right back at the beginning. That's it. Forward. There we go. Next one. There we go. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, what he did was um, to invite companies, and here was Parker Pens. Uh, there was a whole raft of about 250 companies who agreed to supply goods in kind, whether it was rope or 
material for the sale or food or medicine, Colgate Palmolive, for example, gave medicine for the, uh, the trip. Um, he gave them free advertisements in Mayflower Mail, but he then went back to them and said, look, I've got a better idea. Um, you can buy a treasure chest. And in that treasure chest, you can put examples of your goods. And uh, when the ship sails across, the treasure chest will go on board. They will be picked up at the other end and sent round and they'll be exhibited at department stores all across America to show the, bread, the best of British uh, goods and services. And he fixed on a price, um, and I think it was at the time, 460 pounds, which the, was the exact amount by which the shipbuilding bill was going up each week. And um, uh, that was a, a major contribution to the cost of building the ship. And at this time, Warwick had met and become good friends with a guy called John Sloan Smith, who was the CEO of Mayflower Aero Transit in America. The company, as you know, is still a um, popular mo moving company, both in America and in Europe. Sloan Smith, who was a passionate, um, uh, uh, had a passionate interest in the Mayflower story, offered to transport the treasure chests across the country to all the exhibitions that Warwick wanted to uh, go to in, at leading department stores. The effort was perhaps ahead of its time because it was well before the concept of co corporate sponsorship. You know, the Nikes of this world ha had not really uh, come onto the, um, the business scene. And at the time, it has to be said, Warwick's partners in Plymouth were horrified, um, as were some of the American and English media. And Warwick was accused of dirty commercialism for something that was supposed to be um, a goodwill gesture. And he had other troubles. There was the question of insuring the ship. Uh, Warwick solved that one by telling the potential insurers that he and the boat builder together would definitely be sailing on Mayflower 2. That should give them confidence, he observed. At the same time, he told the underwriters of Lloyd's of London that he needed the policy written in the language of the 1600s and signed by each underwriting partner in ink. And it's really fascinating um, how at every point along the way, Warwick looked to do things as as close to the 1600s or late 1500s as possible. Here you see an example um, of using um, uh, tools um, uh, of that period that Warwick insisted upon, uh, which of course added to uh, the cost. But Warwick had a really big problem when he thought he'd solved all the ones I've just mentioned. And that was a national shipbuilding strike. Um, and he had to use all his powers of persuasion to allow the shipbuilding union, uh, to persuade the shipbuilding union, uh, I'm sorry, to allow the construction of Mayflower to continue while every other yard in the country fell silent. Remember at that time, Britain was a, important shipbuilding uh, country. However, it was a military invasion and a minor war that actually threatened the whole project. The British government had conspired with France and Israel to invade Egypt to take control of the Suez Canal, which is a vital shipping uh, channel to the Indian Ocean uh, and uh, had been nationalized by the Egyptian president uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Unfortunately, the British government had neglected to tell their principal ally, President Eisenhower, of their plans. Eisenhower was furious. He was trying to lecture the Soviet Union at the time about the need to recognize the sovereignty of other nations, particularly Hungary. And at the same time, he was facing re-election. 
So the deceptively mild-mannered American president made his ally, the British, as well as the French and the Israelis, an offer they couldn't refuse. Uh, back then, the dollar was all powerful and they were told to get out of Egypt fast. The British retreated, but the British public were very upset with what they saw as the lack of American support for their soldiers um, in the battlefield. And that put any thought of a, uh, appeal for public donations to an end. So he couldn't use public donations to raise the balance of the funds to finish Mayflower II. Throughout the seemingly never-ending drama of the fundraising, Warwick did not, it has to be said, make things easy for himself. His insistence on building work being done using the tools of the late 1500s um, was a good example because it meant that 20th century builders had to undergo quite a bit of training to use those old fashioned tools. And of course they were slower to work with. So if we look through the next slides, you'll get a feel for how um, uh, the ship was constructed. And the next slide, here's some of the tools, the traditional shipbuilding tools um, that were used uh, during the construction of Mayflower. And it's, these are part of an exhibition at Gainsborough Heritage Museum, which I would recommend to any American visitors or visitors from anywhere, actually. It's a lovely museum to spend a day there, very friendly people. And they tell the whole story of the rebuilding um, of, of Mayflower. And go to the next slide, please. Here, they're putting, uh, uh, the finishing touches uh, to the equipment that is going to be, uh, add to uh, the anchor. And the next slide, here's the men working with these old fashioned tools inside um, the belly of the ship and so on. So the next slide, this was something that uh, Warwick hadn't expected uh, when the ship was finally launched, um, it sped out across uh, Brixham Bay, keeled over, as you can see, um, at 45 degrees, and nearly went to the bottom of Brixham Harbour before it had gone anywhere. Uh, the problem um, was quickly solved um, because um, Warwick. Um, talked to one of his um, naval advisors um, and he said, look, you know, there's no ballast in that ship. Those ships of that era uh, used to be built to carry a lot in their hold. They were cargo ships. So loaded up with um, uh, railway iron, uh, about 80 tons should do the trick. And then she'll be sinking, sit in the water just fine. And my advice to you, and this was from an admiral, is not to hang around waiting for the admiralty to review your sea trials because they, they might want you to do more trial work than you really want to make. So if we go to the next slide, um, in four, after four days of sea trials, basically pottering around Brixham Harbour in the English Channel, there's very little wind, they set sail um, uh, for America. Uh, you know, a desperate, and I have to say exhaust, exhausted Warwick, willed the ship to sail with 33 men and a cat called Felix. And it arrived safely after 53 days at sea in early June, 1957. And the entire world, or so it seemed, forgot their cares for that period of time and followed its progress. It was an era dominated by the printed press and reports appeared daily in multiple languages around the world. Even when the ship was becalmed, newspapers found something to write about. You know, they would headline ships becalmed. Then the next day, let's say Mayflower becalmed again. And the next day, Mayflower still becalmed. 
Um, and in between, they would write about the religious beliefs of the early settlers, explore the meaning of the Mayflower Compact and its connection to democratic rule in both the United States and elsewhere, Mayflower fashions, Mayflower food, um, Anglo, uh, the Anglo-American connection. And, you know, people like Eleanor Roosevelt wrote in their weekly column um, uh, uh, about the Mayflower. She arrived at Province, Provincetown. Here you see cro uh, Mayflower crossing paths um, with the Ark Royal, um, uh, one of Britain's largest um, military ships of the time. And um, you can see, um, well, you can't see, but I can tell you that it was quite an emotional uh, moment um, for the sailors on both sides, um, uh, on both ships. Uh, so Mayflower arrived at Provincetown on June the 12th, 1957, and there with his trademark sense of history, Warwick staged a reenactment, which I think we can see with the next slide. No, what we see in the next slide is a lovely picture um, of Felix the cat, and uh, that's Graham Nunn, who was uh, one of the two cabin boys um, aboard the ship. Um, so um, I have to tell you that um, Felix the cat was actually a legal immigrant um, and <laughs> no papers. He was whisked off and spent the rest of his life with an American cabin boy um, who sailed on a ship called Joe Meany. And I talk about that in my book. So if we go to the next slide, here we see Warwick in the middle uh, with Captain Villiers at the right and um, a man called Harry Kemp um, who was known as the poet of the dunes, signing a copy um, of um, a Mayflower Compact. So on to the next slide. And here you see the key things in the Mayflower Compact. Um, combining ourselves together in a civil body politic for our better ordering, just and equal laws for the general good. Um, it's a short document signed by, I think it's 41 men, but um, it, it's a one, uh, it's a document of enormous importance, I think, to many people interested in uh, rule by democracy. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide. A few days later, uh, Warwick was greeted by thousands of onlookers. Um, at, um, at Plymouth Harbour, and you can see him, uh, there's a drummer boy uh, leading uh, his captain, uh, Captain Villiers, Warwick is third in line, and I think it's Joan Meany, the American cabin boy, who Warwick said he, he insisted on having one American um, uh, student um, uh, on the ship. Um, uh, a student that was actually picked by another former president, um, Herbert Hoover, who was at that time uh, chairman of the boys clubs or president of the boys clubs of America. So um, thousands of onlookers saw nothing but the lovely ship. Uh, the press, however, reported the wonderful welcome but also the fact that Warwick had left England in a little bit of a hurry with some unpaid debts. And my father, as you uh, would expect, um, uh, was, uh, went from, uh, I don't know what, what to say, from savior <laughs> to goat. Um, you know, it was roundly condemned in the newspapers much to the embarrassment of the people in Plymouth who were due to take uh, care of the ship. And over the next two years, Warwick sailed the ship first to New York, where my father had organized an exhibition um, uh, in the summer, and then on to Miami uh, before sailing back to Washington, D.C and arriving at its permanent birth in Plymouth. 
uh, revenue from Mayflower's exhibition actually paid off the remaining debts. Meanwhile, Mayflower Aero Transit sponsored my father for two years on a multi-state tour of the United States, where he retold the Mayflower adventure and promoted the upcoming opening of the Pilgrim Village at Plymouth Plantation. Then he returned to the new UK with $15 in his pocket and resumed his career as a writer. Sadly, he was never invited back to Plymouth Plantation. And uh, in the years that followed, he visited Plymouth, Massachusetts unannounced from time to time and, and talked to the staff. Uh, I went with him more than once, staff that looked after the ship. But there was a reluctance to tell my father the story. Visitors often left with the impression that the ship was actually the gift of the British government or the British people. And a few even got the impression that Mayflower was the original ship. Um, over the years, the revenue from Mayflower 2, though, has been used to fund the operations of the Living History Museum, uh, which was one of the most successful, as you know, in America. The construction of the first village and the accompanying reception area shops and car parks. My father had hoped that Mayflower 2 would be sailed up and down the coastal towns and cities of America and throughout the Great Lakes, but that was not to be. Why? Well, because it was a gift to America and the American people, and he, want, he wanted as many people to see it as possible. And, you know, that caused a level of conflict between him and the managers uh, of Plymouth Plantation, as did his dream of helping to establish Anglo-American scholarships with surplus funds from Amer Mayflower exhibition fees. However, I've recently begun a small family foundation to fulfill my father's objective. Um, and I emphasize the small. Or well, one of the first Mayflower scholarships was awarded last year to students at the University of Plymouth in England. Uh, this year, a young volunteer at Alden House in Duxbury received a Warwick Charlton Foundation Award to help finance her college studies. And a commitment has been made to further scholarships in partnership with Alden House. My father died in 2002. And um, at that time, the, there was a new um, chief executive at Plymouth Plantation, a lady called Nancy Brennan. And she was kind enough to invite um, uh, Charlton's, uh, Warwick Charlton's family including myself and siblings and my father's widow, uh, to a memorial service on board the Mayflower. And we took his ashes um, across um, with us and gave them to some of the staff who had lovingly looked after the ship over many years. And they buried his ashes deep in the crevices of Mayflower too. I'm sure my father would be delighted to know that although he gave Mayflower 2 to the American people, it has been his, his last resting place has been lovingly restored by American craftsmen, many of them who were trained in Newport, which I think is a wonderful tribute to uh, that town. And I'm, I can imagine my father being unable to contain his excitement at the news that the ship he built and gave to America for a dollar has been restored for over $11 million and is now officially recognized as a national treasure. His somewhat embarrassing ship um, is now famous as Nathaniel Philbrick said, 
if he was alive today, I would pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he would reread a copy of the telegram he sent when he handed over Mayflower 2 to American Care back in 1957. It read, today I hand over Mayflower 2 to your safekeeping. May she be a reminder to the people of our two countries that although the Atlantic Ocean may separate us, it can never keep us apart. Uh, and with that, I'd like to pause and invite any questions. Thank you for listening. Uh, Randall, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating story, amazing really, and um, really great that um, Iris uh, and the craftsmen there have uh, an important role to play in the refitting of the ship. Uh, let's go to question number one. Uh, oh, well, it's a comment. A thank you from a descendant of the 25 original passengers of the Mayflower, Alan Noel. Uh, let's see. Let's keep going. Uh, here's somebody that asks, any comparison to the Kalmar nickel replica would be appreciated. Do you have any comments on that? I do not. Yeah. Um, okay. You, you, that Whoever asked that question has the advantage of me. I do not know about that replica. I know um, of other replicas of Mayflower that... Um, have been built not uh, not to you know built models really to scale. Not uh, none that I know of um, have uh, sailed across uh, uh, the Atlantic. Okay, Edwin Garrett uh, makes a comment that it is uh, a question also. If he was able to find plans for the Mayflower, I do wonder if any plans can be found for the Welcome or any of the other 22 ships which carried the original settlers of Pennsylvania. Right, that's a really interesting question. Um, at that time, uh, shipbuilders were not required to lodge their plans uh, with the Admiralty. It changed in the early 1600s, but at the time when Mayflower and other ships of its type were built, uh, it was up to the individual um, shipbuilders who passed their trade on from one generation to another um, to, uh, to build almost um, from memory. And um, it was pretty standard. One of the things that William Baker the American that I referred to, the uh, Bethlehem Steel executive, he looked at and studied the building practices of ships of that period extensively. And there were many ships built to the same standard. And incidentally, there were uh, several ships all carrying the name of Mayflower. It was a common name for ships. So there's no, um, there are no uh, precise plans, but what William Baker was able to do, traveling both to Holland and, and throughout England and spending a lot of time at Greenwich and elsewhere, was able to look at records and figure out um, the design in, in some considerable detail. I mean, Warwick said, used to say, he got the design accurate down to the ink wells in the captain's cabin. Um, I'm not sure that that's quite correct, but um, uh, William Baker was recognized um, in later life as being one of the um, premier, if, if not the premier researcher of the design of ships of the period. Uh, John Tepe, the man who mentioned the Kalmar Nickel, has just written, Kalmar Nickel brought Swedes to Wilmington, Delaware in 1638 to found the new Sweden colony. Right. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. Um, and um, I've got some homework to do there. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Randall, I... 
I know it's very late for you. I know it's past midnight. I want to thank you very much for a fascinating story. Uh, and one day, hopefully, it'll come to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, as we had planned, as you well know. We had, I should mention to everyone, uh, planned a big slate of festivities uh, for its arrival in May. Of course, that was put on hold. Um, and, uh, but maybe at some point soon. Uh, right. And I'd like to thank you, you to come for, back. Yeah. I, I, and when that happens, I would love nothing more than to visit Newport again and maybe give a talk in person. And by that time, I know, uh, may know a little more about that Swedish ship. Okay, done. Count on it. Uh, and that could be next summer, God willing, with the vaccine. Yeah. So anyways, uh, thank you again, uh, Randall, and we'll talk very soon. Uh, for those of you still watching, I'd like to invite you all for the last two programs of the year on Wednesday, December 9th. We'll welcome Frederick Kaufman, author of The Money Plot, A History of Currency's Power to Enchant, Control, and Manipulate. Uh, it's a controversial history delving into the past 65,000 years to demystify the concept of money, reminding us that in the end, money in all its forms is just fiction. Uh, and we'll run out the year on Wednesday, December 16th with Dr. Edward Marquard, who will continue with his music appreciation series um, sponsored by the Jarzombek family. Uh, at that time, the discussion will be on Handel's Messiah. Now, uh, again, if you are inclined, we'd be grateful uh, if you would want to donate, push the donate button at the bottom. Uh, if you choose to watch again this program, which will be recorded on our YouTube channel, by all means, uh, please, if you wouldn't mind, subscribe. Uh, that's very helpful to us uh, in what we're trying to do. So again, I want to thank Mr. Charlton and I want to thank all of the viewers and thank you very much and we will see you on December 9th for the talk by Frederick Kaufman. Thank you all so much and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.